everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our webcast, Employee Privacy is Evolving, Are You Ready? Brought to you by iDiscovery Solutions and today's General Counsel. Before I kick off today's webinar, I'd like to address a few housekeeping items. We are happy to offer CLE credits for today's event. Please fill out the survey and respond to the pop-up check-in. We will apply for CLE credit to each state identified after completion of the webinar, and it takes up to four weeks before certificates are distributed. Please note, as our invitation mentioned, the states for which we are offering CLE credit are Arizona, California, Connecticut, Florida, Georgia, Illinois, Minnesota, Missouri, North Carolina, New Jersey, New York, Rhode Island, Tennessee, Texas, and Wisconsin. CLE credit is only available for this live day and not for our on-demand viewers. The survey can be answered at any time through the survey icon at the bottom of the screen, or it will pop up at the end of the webinar. Be sure to respond to the pop-up and survey, otherwise we won't have proof of your participation in the webinar and won't be able to provide CLE credit. If you have pop-up blockers enabled, you may want to disable them during the webinar. I'd also like to bring your attention to the resource icon at the bottom of your screen. From here, you can download the deck and other subject matter content you may find of interest. We encourage you to use the Q&A feature, which will be monitored throughout the entire program. If you have questions about the subject matter, they will be answered during the presentation or the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. And if your question isn't addressed today, we will follow up with you after the event. If you have a technical or CLE-related question, you may also use the Q&A box, and we'll do our best to assist you. Lastly, please note this webinar is being recorded and will be available for on-demand viewing. And now, it is my pleasure to introduce the distinguished speakers for today's webinar, Willie Burden, Jr., in-house counsel of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters, Carrie Burke, partner at Cypher Shaw, Hunter McMahon, Chief Operating Officer of iDiscovery Solutions. And now, Hunter, I will pass the mic to you. Thanks, Lainey, and thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, we're gonna be here for about the next hour talking about privacy and employees and how those two areas intersect as technology has really evolved over the course of time, more so in recent years. Uh, but before we get going, I wanna give both Willie and Carrie a chance to introduce themselves a little bit more. Carrie. Sure, thanks Hunter, and thanks everyone for being here today. My name is Kerry Burke. I am a partner in Seifarth Shaw's Atlanta, Georgia office. I practice primarily labor management relations, and I also litigate employment cases. And to the extent my clients are looking to buy a business, I help them out with the diligence process in advance of that. And Willie, sir. Yes, uh, hello everyone. Thanks for uh, letting me speak with you all today. Willie Burton, in-house counsel with the IVT. Uh, the, my profile includes uh, representing our Amazon division and our public service division, as also as providing advice to our Department of uh, Political and Legislative Action. So uh, looking forward to speaking with you all here today. Awesome, thanks Willie. And my name is Hunter McMahon. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at IDS, uh, both a legal and technology background, uh, but am fascinated about how this intersection of uh, technology, the ability to monitor uh, for performance and uh, monitor for different reasons, safety included, uh, has intersected with the world of privacy investigations and everything of the sort. So with that, we wanted to take a quick poll at the beginning to understand the audience. And so that if everybody could go ahead and take a quick moment and click on this, you know, do you monitor your employees' activities? Pretty simple. Uh, I think a lot of companies, depending on your type of company, either monitor your employees a lot or very minimally, uh, but we wanna see how the audience is taking this. As Lainey said at the beginning, we want everybody to answer questions throughout. Uh, we'll do our best to answer them in real time, but if we don't get to it, we'll try to get to it at the end. So with that, I, votes are starting to come in. Carrie, what do you predict? I think we're going to see a combination of either B or C. I think there's probably some monitoring, and, and quite frankly, there's probably more monitoring than folks are aware of. Excellent. Willie, from your perspective, sir? Yeah, I, would, I was going to go with the same B, perhaps C. I, I believe there's probably, as it is in most cases, uh, s some of that happening without necessarily being intentional or maybe even aware that it's occurring. 
So. That, that's a big change in technology, right? It's not so much as somebody's sitting there writing something down on a piece of paper, but technology is working in the background. So let's, oh, I think we have a clear winner, B, but there's definitely some in the A category. We've got some that are using it to monitor performance. We have a good amount that say, I don't know. Uh, so for those that those members in the audience, the answer is probably <laughs> you just don't know. Uh, and then we have some not not so much uh, not that level of monitoring, which is an affirmative. You know, we're not going to go there. So as we talk about today and we, and we look at this, we're going to review some example laws and regulations and how this is coming about. We're going to talk about real world situations and then we're going to end with a practical checklist because we want you all walking away from this webinar with a tool and an approach that you can take back to your respective entities. So with that, let's talk about how this has transformed. Why, why are we even talking about this? So Carrie, I'm gonna start with you. How has the, your world transformed in the last five, 10, 15 years? Sure, thanks Hunter. And you know, that's, that's a tough question to answer given the rise of chat GPT and large language models over the past couple months. But I mean, looking back a little bit, I think you can still say it's changed in immeasurable ways, beginning with this thing. I mean, we are all constantly connected via our cell phones now. There's the expectation, whether it's stated or not, that most folks at our manager level and above are online as often as they need to be to deal with workplace issues. And with that, as, as we'll talk about, comes a, a whole bunch of privacy and monitoring issues that, that employers need to be aware of and understand so that they don't hit the tripwires that are associated with these types of tools. Because it's not, it can't be done, it's just how it's done, correct? Let's let's start with that baseline. Yes, yeah, so that's exactly right. It's, it's not a you can't do this kind of thing, it's, it's more along the lines of you need to one, understand what you're doing so that you can put in guardrails to ensure that the only folks that need to look at this information and have access to it are doing those two things. Well, and, and if you look at some of these examples, and then Willie, I want your perspective. You know, you used to send in mail or a, literally a physical letter. Now it's an email. You know, I remember the Thomas guides when you would get mixed up from page one and you had to flip to F G and, you know, cause you crossed, crossed the page lines. Now it's an app uh, that tracks your location, working on a case recently where the historical location was stored in their Google account associated with their phone now we've got that kind of monitoring or, or that kind of data being created, whether or not it's monitored is a different question. Of course, we've got the thumbprints. We'll talk about that later. We've got computers and vehicles. We've got real time monitoring. So Willie, from your perspective, how has it really changed in the last five, 10 years? Yeah, no, I, I think in addition to everything I was mentioning in part, maybe, you know, some of the same aspects here, but I think I start off, you know, first and foremost, automation, you know, just the basis replacing many jobs in the industry. I think particularly when we look at manufacturing, retail, and the transportation industry. Now, of course, this new technology also created new jobs. We have new jobs as it pertains to like machine learning and, and data science. But at the same time, we have to, you know, be, uh, be, be cognizant and aware of the impact on perhaps the low skilled workers. I think most of us are very familiar with perhaps maybe our local McDonald's or CVS. And you can probably, if you take a snapshot of the past five years, uh, clearly see that uh, much of those processes have been automated. Technology though, the same note has also made it easier for uh, individuals to work remotely. So this can increase productivity, reduce costs for employers, but also uh, contribute to a better work life balance and flexibility for workers. Uh, the gig economy. I think that is what we're seeing there is, uh, is a direct uh, responsibility or consequence of the technology that we now have available to us. Uh, Services are being provided through online platforms. This is also, again, giving workers I think increased flexibility and autonomy, but at the same time, must recognize that in many circumstances that these workers now do not have access to perhaps the traditional benefits and protections that they normally have, such as health insurance and unemployment insurance. So uh, with that being said, also, you have uh, training and education has become a lot more efficient, easier to, to do with also the advent of technology and to be able to access content from your phone, for cell, from your cell phone. Um, but also, I think it was also the primary, maybe the perhaps the primary conversation that we have today, but the, 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 the created information sharing, but also surveillance problems for employees is critical and probably the most confusing and, 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 and yet to be uh, determined uh, in regards to the feasibility and what protection should be offered 
um, in regards to the technology having an impact on digital monitoring, data breaches and misuse, and also even things like cyberbullying that we see that uh, workers face now from employers and also coworkers. So I think that uh, with that being said, you know, there's a bunch of material out here in regards to, you know, what do we want to talk about with regards to how technology has impacted the, the workforce today. But I think those it's, are just- It's not a simple answer, right? I mean, technology has inherently introduced a complexity. Um, you, you have the opportunity to offer a great convenience or a new resource such as remote remote training, but now we can monitor, you know, where the eyes were and how they read something and how long they spent on it. Uh, I often do a presentation at the local elementary school, you know, a career day. And one of the things that I present on is all of the forensics and what we can do on mobile devices. And the interesting thing about that is the kids think it's really fun and cool because we can go find stuff and you can even see how somebody walks based off of the, the data on their phone until we tell them that they can, we can now monitor how engaged they were when they did their homework last night online and we caught them not doing the homework or the reading the entire time that they were actually distracted. And they go from this is really cool to you shouldn't do this anymore. A total change in perspective from the kids that are in elementary school, they understand the impact. I often say, I'm an informed consumer, I have one phone, a lot of folks try to separate the two. Again, I understand what's going on versus somebody that doesn't. So with that in mind, we brought up two areas that we're gonna focus on uh, today. And, and bear in mind for the audience, there are a multitude of regulations and areas that you should look at for this compliance. These are just two examples. Uh, but today we're gonna focus on the NLRB memo as well as BIPA because there's an intersection that happened recently. And so we've got a good connection between those two. But Carrie, how about you walk us through GC memo 2302 and what, what a GC memo is for the audience reference and what it is not. Sure, so a GC memo is really a statement of priorities. And, and let me back up a little bit even further than that. So the National Labor Relations Board's general counsel's name is Jennifer Abrizzo. She is, for the most part, a career public servant and has had stints with the Communications Workers of America as well. And, you know, we are going to talk a lot about her priorities today. And I want to just make sure for the audience's perspective that I make clear right now that, you know, I have a ton of respect for General Counsel Abrizzo. I appreciate very much that she puts her priorities out on the table. I think that that's useful for employers to understand where she wants the board to go. I just happen to have a disagreement with respect to the way that she interprets the National Labor Relations Act. Now that said, this general counsel memo, as I said, is a statement of what I feel to be priorities. What the general counsel is directing the regions that she's over to look into and to push when they're investigating cases. And so while this document is not law, it is aspirational to become law to the extent that it moves forward. Is that, is that a helpful starting point for us, Hunter? Perfect. So for clarity, and just make sure everybody understands it from a different set of words, this is, the, this is a guideline, but not necessarily enforceable at this point. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And, and you know, this general counsel memo, I think, initially blew a lot of employers' hair back um, because it does a lot of things or asks for a lot of things that we'll look into in a moment you know, my initial impression of it, and, and I'm curious about what yours was, Willie, is that this is sort of one of those instances where it, there's a solution in search of a problem. And by that, I mean, historically, the National Labor Relations Board and its general counsel and its regions, in my mind, has not been afraid to map the National Labor Relations Act, which is a very old law, onto new technology. And I think that we see them doing that on a regular basis. Take as but one example, the Facebook and social media cases from the mid 2010s. There was a whole line of case law about whether or not an employee who goes online and makes some statements about their wages and hours and benefits while also making some snide comments about their employer is engaged in protected concerted activity. And those cases in large part said that they were, which I think is in line with historical board decisions that consider what an employee, whether an employee is engaged in protected and concerted activity when they're making some snide comments to their manager in person, while at the same time discussing wages, hours, and other terms and conditions of employment. And so to me, this seems sort of similar in that 
the general counsel through GC memo 2302 is directing the regions to take a very hard look at what I think are generally typical employer monitoring tools. You know, the, the memo uses things, uh, terms of phrase like omnipresent surveillance. I'm not sure that cameras in the warehouse, which have been around for 15 years, would amount to things like omnipresent surveillance, particularly when they're not in a break room, or things like driver facing cameras and outward facing cameras on trucks would amount to omnipresent surveillance when, as but one example, they're generally required in order to keep insurance on those trucks. But the idea behind this memo is that not only will the general counsel direct the regions to take a hard look at these typical employee monitoring tools to determine whether they're being used to unlawfully surveil employees, but to the extent that they might be, the general counsel is going to presume that these tools are unlawful. And with that, I'll, I'll stop and, and turn it back over to Hunter or Willie for their thoughts on this. So, Kerry, before we go to the presumption, I, I do want to clarify for the audience or ask you a question to clarify. Just d does a company have to have a union to be bound by the NLRA? No, and that's such a good predicate question. They do not. The NLRA, NLRA and the National Labor Relations Board a search jurisdiction over just about every single private company that there is with limited exceptions for companies that engage or organizations that are primarily engaged in religious functions. So this is not just a concern for employers with unionized workforces. It's really a broader concern for employers of all types in the private sector. Perfect. So Willie, one of the things Carrie said and was going to be my question to you is this notion of a presumption that it's being misused as opposed to, okay, you have a legitimate purpose. You said something earlier that caught my attention around, you know, the evolution and how employees understand what is going on. So from your vantage point, how is, should it be a presumption of misuse or is that going too far? Yeah, well, I think that in this circumstance, the pr presumption is appropriate uh, and just because there's a few different other things that are being considered. So, so first and foremost, the presumption can only stand if a reasonable person would find the practice to either prevent or interfere with an activity that would be protected by the act. So I, I think that, you know, just in starting there, first and foremost, there's still a reasonable standard, which is traditional underboard precedent in regards to governing how this conversation is going to happen at the onset. You know, second, there's the balancing equation between businesses' needs and employers' rights. This is also very important. I mean, it allows for employers to communicate their reasons for why this technology is relevant, why this is necessary. I think most unions respect that there's certainly efficiency reasons and safety reasons in many cases for this technology to be implemented. But at the same time, we must have this in order to balance against employees' rights to engage in confidential dis discussions. Um, and to consider their Section 7 activity, consider Section 7 activity and also understand their rights. The third, and perhaps maybe most importantly, the presumption creates the mechanism whereby now, and this is also important in, in understanding the, how this operates between the difference between employees that maybe unionizes versus those that don't. Unions typically have a collective bargaining agreement or other mechanism which they can combat pretext. But in this sense, for a worker that is ununionized, uh, the disclosure requirements of the certain uh, technologies being used uh, allows these individuals to at least rely on that and assist them in understanding how they're being monitored and how they're being managed. Now, I mean, in my opinion, this in many circumstances is a little consequence to employers to allow to uh, afford their employees information in regards to how they're being monitored and managed. Obviously, you know, unless there's another purpose there. Uh, but the presumption in this way ensures that any of the employers who fall under the NLRB's jurisdiction are communicating with their employees about productivity standards and about the information that's collected. And I think that this allows both employees and unions to do their jobs more effectively uh, and, and certainly without uh, feeling as much tension or, or maybe intimidation, whether it be intentional or not, as coming from the employer. So at the risk of opening Pandora's box a little bit here, in the sense of uh, having been involved in so many data d investigations wherein sometimes they didn't even, uh, the company didn't even appreciate the type of data that they were collecting. Um, they may have it, but they're not monitoring it. Is there a distinction you would draw between having data and actively monitoring that data, Willie? 
Mm-hmm. I think I think the I think the only distinction would be perhaps how, for example, in the union context, how the union would respond to it. And I think it really does come down to how the data is being used. Uh, most employees want to be aware, particularly I think, and we're going to talk about a little bit later about biometric data. Most individuals, not just I mean, all of us would like to know how our information is being collected and used if it's being collected. Uh, at all now you know if it's being collected but then also another and different conversation or let's just say a part of that conversation is how is it being used i think for workers primarily they're concerned with it use being used for disciplinary purposes so i think you know with employers i think that's the reason why the disclosure is important because it's a much different conversation if we're talking having a conversation about protecting the workers safety or dealing with some issue that in regards is going to help them do their job more effectively or efficiently versus perhaps using it uh, most particularly, I think, in the uh, unorganized context for workers that are unorganized, uh, used as a tool to single out individuals that otherwise would be taking some sort of collective action. So I think that's the nuance and the distinction that we have to draw. It, it certainly is a, you know, depends on a bunch of factors in any given situation. I think those are some lines we can discuss. So, Harry, I- you probably more from a management perspective and and working with the corporate clients have had the experience where, okay, where do we start? So with this memo out, understanding that, you know, it's not necessarily rule yet, but more of a guideline and a direction of where things go and a question from the audience is perfect. How do we even start to approach this issue? Yeah, I think that's a great question and and it doesn't have an easy answer, right? And, And in part, that's because In my mind, the memo is a little bit, I think amorphous would be an appropriate turn of phrase. There's a lot of discussion about review of an employer's quote unquote holistic surveillance practices. And what does that really mean? It's it's hard to know based on the text of the memo itself and without the regions actually putting some complaints out on paper, what this is actually focused on. As but one example, A lot of employers these days, particularly in the retail and warehousing spaces, have employees wear badges where they swipe when entering and exiting a door. That's not new technology. I suppose it can potentially be used to, quote unquote, surveil an employee. But that's, I think, for among other reasons, security reasons. When you have products or materials that that can be walked off the floor, it's important to know where your employees might have been when that product disappeared. Same thing for clocking in and clocking out. That's not new technology. Is that something that the regions and the general counsel are going to be taking a look at when considering the employer's holistic management or surveillance practices? Uh, At this stage, I just don't know, and, and we won't know until these move through the board's processes. But to get back to your original question, where do we start? I mean, I think step zero, as Willie alluded to, is understanding what technology you as an employer have in place, how it's used and where that data is stored. And in addition to that, who has access to that data? I think once you've answered those first four questions, then the next thing that you ought to be doing in my mind is ensuring that the business case for the use of that technology, the storage of that data, and the folks who have access to it all make sense and are aligned with this potential surveillance framework. So before we move on to the next example and dive into a real world scenario, there's a question from the audience. How does the NLRB exercise jurisdiction over non-unionized private facilities and the operations and employees? They are a privately held manufacturing company with some unionized employees, but have never had an inspection or enforcement action by the NLRB for non-union. Is that typical? The the notion that, oh, sorry, go ahead. Willie, do you want to take that? Uh, Sure. I mean, so I think in that context, the, the, the best answer is that just because those individuals on the shop floor uh, even in a even on a work setting where you have unionized and non-unionized workers, those workers that are non-unionized still have Section 7 rights, and so they can still ask the board to come and do an investigation. They still have the ability to file unfair labor practice charges. Now, typically that is uh, less common if particularly these individuals are also unaware of their rights. That's also, you know, I think a, 
a, a problem that unions also at least see um, in regards to how the you know we're having these conversations around the current workforce. But um, but though it's not it's not it would not be uncommon. It's just perhaps not typical because there may have not been a situation where those employees have yet felt that they needed to pursue the board or may not be aware of it. Anything to add, Carrie, before we move on? The, the only gloss I would add that I think is important is that in, it's not only employees that can file these charges, it's any person. And we see that in certain contexts. There are occasions where, uh, as one example, an organizer will go ahead and file a charge on behalf of employees. Sometimes law firms affiliated with organizers will file charges. And on the flip side, it's important to remember, too, that employers also have rights under the National Labor Relations Act and in certain instances file charges as well. So one of the things that uh, the GC said at the recent ABA conference that we were all in attendance at um, was one of her areas of focus for this would be drivers. Plain and simple, she came out, she said it, uh, and, and you know, driver facing cameras, all of the data that's collected about drivers throughout the different, uh, different technology and so we wanted to illustrate that to everybody because if you're not familiar with the transportation industry you may say what what kind of data are they collecting i mean there's a lot of data there's everything from the gps the dash cams both outward facing and uh driver facing you've got different safety how hard you press the brakes how hard you press the gas there's a lot of data that's coming from this technology and a lot of it is safety oriented a lot of it is how do we protect both the driver the company and different things here it, it, they even illustrate on their website why you know we've got ai powered that's new we've got audio feedback coaching positive recognition so it's not all just negative accountability but you know safety awards and bonuses and those kinds of things that can take place uh, but we had a real world situation recently where there was a board opinion on a driver involved uh protected activity and so we've got a quick summary uh we've got the employer Based, you know, I'll summarize it and let Carrie and Willie, if you want to chime in. But a manager told an employee to uncover his driver facing uh, camera from uh, during a break. And the employee felt like that was surveillance. Uh, and the board side with the employee uh, that the impression of surveillance by accessing the inside facing camera during his lunch break was a problematic. And so Willie, I want to start with you because you brought it up and, and understanding what the feeling of a reasonable person, I believe, is what you said earlier. How did you see this opinion? Yeah, so I think that first and foremost, we can start with some critical facts in this case that, you know, I believe is what uh, perhaps is what made this uh, unlawful um, impression that the person was being surveilled. So. First and foremost, I think all employers should understand that, um, I mean, like with anything, there's hardly ever a benefit of the doubt, whether right, wrong, or indifferent, when you're dealing with a company that has a history of anti-union animus. And so here, the employee in question was already known union supporter that was reinstated. This gives credibility to his feeling and understanding of the situation in, in many people's eyes, particularly if you look at it from the employee or the union context. Uh, most unions do acknowledge that cameras like this should have a benefit, perhaps in protecting drivers from liability or even providing update directions um, on uh, info on traffic patterns. But still, break time is break time. I think that's the other critical fact here of this case. This employee was eating lunch at that time, and it was undisputed that there was no ongoing safety issue. There was no accident. There was not even a harsh break report or even a stop in a usual area and the management uh, acknowledged that that would be a situation in which they usually would check in on this individual. So I think that this alone represented a, a change in operations. It was something that was added out of the ordinary that the employer did. It's another critical fact the that I believe- said He didn't normally do it. It was a fluke. He happened to look on, right? Didn't the manager just, I, I just happened to look on then and his camera happened to be covered up. Yeah, and if, if it's, I don't think the violation happened by looking on, but certainly then engaging in the conversation and telling the individual that he must uh, turn it back on. I think that that in itself right there is the impression because you have not done this before. 
So even if it was a mistake this time and it was something that was just done of accident, then perhaps, you know, it should have been communicated that way as opposed to trying to create a new rule on the fly. And so I think that that is going to raise a red flag for, you know, most unions and most employees. So I think that's particularly why the decision came out here. And again, I want to highlight here, there was also a history of ULPs, a history of discharging, a history of surveillance. And so there was a historical understanding there by the employees as well in regards to what this employer may be trying to do. But I'll, I'll so Willie, from, from your per perspective, it, the history of the relationship was very impactful in this. And then also the fact that just because I said I didn't routinely did it and I, you know, happened by the monitoring because that was so out of the norm and it wasn't per the documentation and the policies that were in place, it looked like an anomaly. It looked like a targeted action as opposed to and surveillance as opposed to I was clicking through my drivers and I noticed that his camera was covered. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, I, and I think an important part of this is this is why I believe that employers should also not necessarily frown upon the, the, the potential obligation to have to disclose this information. Because if you disclose the information in regards to why it's being used, you communicate that and the employees can, and can understand exactly how this may be used against them, then that lessens the likelihood that they're going to feel that they're being surveilled for another purpose. So the, the, that's, that's an interesting clarity. And Carrie, I want your perspective. It was surveilled for a different purpose as opposed to, you know, surveillance at all. So it wasn't, it wasn't I didn't know that there was a camera. It wasn't a hidden camera. It was that I was on my break time and I didn't think you should be able to monitor me during that. And therefore, if you are, I have this feeling of surveillance, surveillance for a purpose that I don't agree with. Well, and, but, and listen, this, this is a case that I think arose from some really bad and unfortunate facts. Um, I think Willie's absolutely right about that. You've got a known un union supporter who's been brought back to work. And for reasons that remain unclear throughout the life of this case, this manager is just saying, hey, I happen to look at your camera, which I never do. And then I happen to text you about it, which I've never done before. Those are two major issues that I think came into play here. And I, I think the other piece that's critical when understanding this decision is just the lack of any policies or guardrails that, that came out in this case with respect to the way that cameras are used and the way that that data is, is looked into. So I think to the extent that the employer had had a policy that was something to the effect of, we expect your cameras to remain visible at all times for safety reasons or what have you, this case might have come out differently. But to tip my cap to Willie's point, the information gulf really does create a chasm that employees in this instance, I think, filled in in a justified manner. You've got, as we talked about, a driver who's a known union supporter feels like he's being hassled. And it, I think he told a credible story in that respect with the manager on the other hand of things saying, well, I don't really know why I did that. And that's just ultimately not a good position to be in when you don't have a reason for the behavior with with which you've engaged. So let's take this to a broader picture, right? You know, not everybody has a fleet of, of vehicles that they're monitoring drivers. You know, they, there's different types of monitoring that is going on. So what from a, a, a computer based user are we talking about when, we, when surveillance is under attack, right? So what kind of monitoring is happening elsewhere that we need to kind of look at this analysis and go, okay, well, if, if you don't routinely look at somebody's emails and all of a sudden you start reading their emails, that's, that's kind of different. Uh, if all of a sudden you're not, you're monitoring how productive they are on their keyboard during meetings or, or something to that effect with or without their notice. I mean, that's a, that's a new one, right? You know, you've got all these great technologies that are monitoring productivity, but do they know that you're monitoring their productivity and do you know how, do they know how you're using them? So what other scenarios are you seeing, Gary? Well, I think you hit the nail on the head. In, in my mind, the, the next big one is, is email. Current extant board law allows employers to put limits on emails for purposes of organizing. That is a change from the Obama board. And we expect this National Labor Relations Board to take that up in, a, in an appropriate case 
and most likely go back to a decision styled verbal communications, which allowed employees, unless there was um, really a critical business reason to prohibit it, to allow them to engage in Section 7 activities via the company's email. And so, you know, that is just going to add an extra gloss in my mind on this whole instant idea of surveillance more broadly, because employers at this point, once that goes into law to the extent that it does, and I think that it will, we'll have just another tripwire to look over when they're considering what sorts of emails are being blasted out. Along with that, I think that you're right. You know, the other one is going to be employer monitoring technology with respect to things like keystrokes, or, you know, we had clients during the pandemic ask whether it was a good idea to require employees to be on camera all day long. And, you know, for purposes of understanding whether they were being productive and and I don't know any lawyer that I've talked to that said, yes, that's a good idea. Go ahead and do it. But, uh, you know, every once in a while we still get I, proposals like that one. And so, you know, the, the, the more technology arises, the more it presents these opportunities for employers to trip up. But OK, so I'm a I'm a large tech company. We're highly remote or, or um, you know, we have people on technology all day long inherently they're collecting data because their systems are so integrated. You know, every time a user takes an action in a given system, they're creating an audit trail of activity. Mm -hmm. But they were doing that a long time ago. Is the distinction now the use of that data as opposed to the creation of that data? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. It's, it's not only what is what is you keeping that data for and what are you looking into it for? So I think there's a difference between looking into, as an example, theft of trade secrets or a violation of a restrictive covenant versus trying to reverse engineer whether one of your employees has reached out to, as an example, Willie's organization. So I think that there's a significant difference in kind there. So Willie, that brings you into the perspective from a, a union side and thinking through I know there's technology there, but I don't know what they're doing. What is your perspective on, you know, a more tech-based company that is focused on optimizing their output or optimizing, you know, their the quality that is coming at? So there's there's a lot of technology that's behind it, but maybe the use case has changed over the years. I always had the data, but now I'm using it differently. I, I think that's correct. I'm, and I also want to reference, you know, a point that Carrie made earlier, which is so we are talking about how to use this technology in a proper manner. But I think also what the board is trying to address is in, in that that comment that Carrie made is like, what is like a, a what is a omni surveillance? Like, what does that mean in, to have, you know, just overreaching surveillance to the extent that an employee does not feel that they have any opportunity to take Section 7 rights? Well, that's the that is the other, I guess, way to frame the question or the matter. And so, when we're talking about this technology, you know, just for example, yes, we may have our standard camera today. It may also have been standard keystrokes. Uh, the cell phone, maybe that's been standard for some other time, but there may be tracking on the cell phone as well. There may have already been policies in place where, for different security reasons, we can access your lockers. And now we may also have you wear a uh, use a, a, a wearable device or something else that helps record uh, how you bend or how you move as well, we're collecting data there. And so from an employee's perspective, if I'm being surveilled when I approach the facility on a camera, when I get to the facility, my communication through my email and cell phone are tapped. I'm also wearing a device that makes the employer aware of where my movements are and where I am at all times. Uh, also, maybe have an employer that's using a heat map to discern where individuals are located in a particular facility. All this together creates an impression of surveillance whereby which the individual may not feel like they're able to communicate about these rights at all. And that does sometimes carry home. Again, when we talk about the phone, you know, depending on what the device is and how this is set up if it's a device that the employer can access even communications you know past the work time will be recorded and will be can be utilized by the employer and so i think that you know when we're looking at it from the union or employee perspective that is the situation that uh i think uh fuels most of our trepidation in terms of approaching a negotiating process or even just in a, a worker on on the shop floor um, in, in looking at how the totality of all of the different new technology uh, has come together to perhaps create a situation where individuals do not feel under any circumstances that they can 
uh, talk with their workers without potential retaliation. Interesting. So, Willie, you, you, you brought something up that I love because of the, the class action work that I've worked on and aggregating data. Uh, in other words, layering a whole bunch of different data together to tell a story because one piece of data is information, you know, you get two and three and four, and now all of a sudden I can understand what Carrie's doing on the weekends. And with that, it's not one source of data that necessarily is the problem, but more of the combination of data and how it can now be combined. Is that what you were getting at? Willie, I think we lost it. Are you back? Yep, I think that's correct. I think that's correct. And I think that's the, again, I think that's the purpose behind why uh, at the least this information, it is a good thing that this information actually uh, prevents an opportunity to limit liability as a result of disclosure. And I think that it also disinforms employees and informs unions so that we can engage in effective bargaining. And so, yes, I, I would say that that'd be my answer, yes. Perfect. We're getting a couple of specific questions. We appreciate those, but we're going to jump to the, or leave some of those to the end for uh, clarity, uh, because I do want to jump into one piece of data that in and of itself can be problematic, and that is biometric information. For those of you not familiar with it, an Illinois statute that says you have to inform the person, you have to tell them the purpose, the length of time you're going to keep it, and you have to get written consent. So there was a recent uh, Illinois Supreme Court decision that that these two worlds collide, uh, both the collective bargaining uh, as well as the biometric information. And, and the short of it there was they said, hey, you bargained for it, so that therefore was your written consent. Willie, are you seeing this more and more in collective bargaining, you know, these kinds of specifics? I think whether or not it was intended to avoid the need for- absolutely consent in this case. I don't know if that was the original intention, but it certainly served the purpose. Absolutely. And, and I think this is a good point. Just also reference that this is uh, something that unions are also having to educate themselves about, educate members about, and also understanding our responsibilities as well. So for unions, anytime we're dealing with a state statute, which in most cases, there's a carve out for a collective bargaining agreement or, or some other type of agreement that was reached between a representative and the workers. Well, that, 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 that agreement in itself may, just as it did in this case, uh, waive the right of the individual to make a claim that their data was being collected against their will. Now for unions, again, this is a good thing in the sense that if unions are doing their job correctly, they would be making this individual aware of what is afforded for the company to do under, and in this case, the management's rights clause, which is probably and perhaps I think in most collective bargain agreements that have not yet contemplated this technology and have not yet adopted specific provisions that concerns how to address technology or the uses of technology, which we do have some, particularly again around the wearable devices that we're seeing more and more become um, something that is, is frequently put in, in a proposal. Um, but, but nevertheless, in this case and in any CBA where there's a broad management's rights clause, it is arguable that that right has been waived, particularly those management right clause includes some language akin to the employee being able to collect information. So, Willie, uh, a great question came in uh, timely for you is, does written consent for purposes of collective bargaining agreements mean each employee must provide a wet ink signature or call the written consent or can the written consent be collected electronically? Uh, it, it actually would require no further consent upon the members if, again, they have already established the uh, collective bargaining representative and that individual through the collective bargaining process has negotiated the right for the employer to be able to collect the data, as we saw in this case. Uh, again, it would probably be behoove most unions to make sure that all of their members understand this uh, and make sure that they have complete buy-in before they agree to terms or conditions that would do so. But uh, to answer the question, uh, no, and in my opinion, it would not require uh, for each employee to then have to provide their signature, either uh, hard copy or electronic. Before I let you off the hook, Willie, really, interesting, you, you talk about having to educate the members. How much of a hurdle is that right now with the speed in which technology is evolving? 
Yes, it's a, it's an immense task and something that, you know, unfortunately, we're still not able to do in certain terms in, in many cases. Uh, a lot of times, again, without knowing the full purpose or whether or not we can rely on the purpose provided to us by the employer in regards to why that is being used, um, it just makes that conversation very difficult. And of course, as we mentioned, sometimes the employers are not even aware. They may be working with a third party vendor, third party contractor that is providing a service that is collecting data and using it for a purpose, or maybe they're not even aware of the extent to which data is being collected. Maybe the union isn't aware as well either. And so then that leads to a situation perhaps like this case where we end up with an individual who's grieved as a result of that data collection. So it's certainly not something that is just a, a, a problem from that perspective for employers. Unions too, you know, through their, their, their to make sure that we're abiding by, you know, our duty to fairly represent individuals and also just, you know, uh, reach effective agreements are still having to do a lot of work ourselves in regards to understanding how all of this stuff works and how we can communicate uh, that to our uh, members. So Carrie, is it all about collective bargaining or are there other mechanisms required? You know, we talked about the NLRA governing non-unionized uh, employers as well. So is that the only way to get this consent? Well, that's a really good question. And, and I won't hold myself out as a BIPA expert, uh, but as in, one of the questions. Let's go wider though, right? BIPA was an example. I mean, collectively about surveillance technology, right? Or other employee monitoring. How else do you get that consent? Well, so, I mean, I think that, that that's a really interesting question. In, in the non-unionized workspace, Oftentimes, I don't think that the employer explicitly needs the consent in order to put in technology that, that is at the forefront. And oftentimes, even in the unionized context, it, the employer might not need to get the consent of the union to implement technology either. You might end up having to bargain over the effects of a new technology but to the extent, as Willie alluded to, that something might be encompassed by a management rights clause. You know, the CDA will govern and the employer can implement that technology. Okay, so I can implement it. Do I have to tell my employees what I'm doing differently now? Well, I think that it's generally a best practice to onboard your employees with new technology and do some training around it when it comes in to the extent that they need to know about it. Oftentimes you've got to balance the rollout of new technology and the way that it's used against things like trade secret concerns or corporate espionage concerns. You know, I wish that it wasn't the case, but in the 21st century world that we live in, and as we've alluded to previously, the fact that half of what we do is on our phone now, employers do have to build in some guardrails and be careful about making, I'll call them fulsome disclosures about exactly what technology they're using and how it exactly works to the rank and file employees. Okay, but I, I, I've got a company owned device I tell them that they have no right to privacy. Do I have a right to monitor however I want on that device? Oh, or of course is... not. And that, that would be terrible advice. But, it, but, I mean... it, but it's my device, it's my technology. They're, they're working for me and I'm paying. Why can't I do what I want on the computer? Well, setting aside all of the issues that we've just talked about and the surveillance problems that would arise under the National Labor Relations Act in a unionized or non-unionized workspace, I think a whole bunch of other considerations would come into play. As but one example, if an employee is engaged in protected activity under one of the myriad other federal and state statutes by using their phone and you as an employer are monitoring them, that can implicate you in Title VII concerns. And yeah, I told them concerns. that they have no right to privacy on the company devices. Yes, and so I guess the, the, the logical next step there is to the extent that you are collecting, reviewing, and I'll use the word surveilling this data, and you've got to make a performance decision with respect to an employee, that is absolutely going to come out in a legal proceeding full stop. And so even if you as an employer had a good and defensible reason for exiting an employee, the fact that you have looked into all of this stuff that they've done, and if protected action under either the National Labor Relations Act or another statute comes out, you are going to have a very hard time resolving that case in your favor. So it, so 
now we're back to that the, the driver uh, opinion that we talked about earlier, right? With the covered camera. Part of what Willie outlined there was a bad set of facts or, or, or an unfortunate set of facts that led to that incident. What you're saying is if, if you're going to have all this technology and you're going to go through all of that monitoring, you better have an ironclad defense as to how it's being used and how it was not used inappropriately for discharge, regardless of that validity of the discharge itself, because you got a lot of data and they don't know you're doing it. So you're you're almost creating your own presumption against yourself. That, that's exactly right. And let's be honest too about this. Managers are wildly busy. They have to run the business. They do not have the time to and should not be expected to monitor their employees off the clock. And if they're being asked to do that, that is one, a significant liability for the employer, but two, a waste of the employer and that manager's time. You mean I can't hire managers just, just to manage the managers to make sure that they're managing their employees to make sure that everybody's reviewing all the data? No. I mean, it's it's your money and your company. You can do what you want. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. So, Willie, from your perspective, you know, knowing that CBA is a, a crutch here or, or a critical component and it can get consent, have you had any incidents where the understanding during the bargaining process was different than the reality or what became reality? Well, I'll say that's typically the, the, the position of most of the employers I deal with. But uh, with that note aside, uh, yes, I, I think that, um, I should say that for, for unions that are addressing this, I think that uh, when these situations are coming up now, it initially prompts two responses. Gary mission maybe affects bargaining requests as it concerns the implementation of, of the whatever it may be. Uh, there's also usually information requests that may be in the same vein. Well, what is the purpose of this? Why are you using this? What statistics to data uh, information? Uh, reports do you have to back up to this effect that you're going to have and above all any disciplinary uh willie we're breaking up so hopefully your internet comes back a little bit carrie i want to throw a question at you before we run out of time uh did you say that the anticipated biden administration will revert to the obama admin policy that employers must allow employees to use company email for union activities because their company prohibits the use of company email for non work. Yes, so that's that's exactly what we expect to have to happen in in the appropriate case in the not too distant future. This is one of General Counsel Brito's stated priorities. Um, and the reasoning that she's put forward is email is the new water cooler. So if you take away an employee's ability, to engage in organizing activities via email, you've basically tied a hand behind their back. That's that's the employer, um, Jennifer Abrito's reasoning. Now, you know, I think this is gonna give a lot of employers heartburn, which probably generated this question. But yes, as a general proposition, employers are going to have a very hard time, even if they have a general rule, prohibiting the use of company email for non-company uh, communications to prohibit employees from using email to engage in Section 7 activity. So uh, a quick follow on to that. How does at will laws come into play when the decision is made to let go of an employee after monitoring their email? Mm. So, you know, I think it's important to understand what employment at will laws are and what they are not. 49 states have employment at will laws. Montana is the notable exception. And that basically just means that unless a statute, a federal law, a state law, or a local law prohibits otherwise, an employer can discharge an employee for a good reason, a bad reason, or really no reason at all, so long as it's not a prohibited reason. And vice versa, an employee can leave a job at will. So, you know, in this space, the National Labor Relations Act is going to trump this notion of at will because it's a, is it a it is excuse me a federal statute that is protecting employees right to engage in protected concerted activity does that make sense it does it does willie do we have you back sir 
yes, I believe I'm back. There we go. Is there any, did you want to finish any thoughts? I'm, no, I'm not sure where I cut off that, but I was just essentially in, in short saying that, you know, when we're dealing with these issues and this technology being proposed that typically enlisted some sort of effects bargaining request, if not also an information request, and the union ultimately has to determine whether that's something that they can uh, resolve through the negotiation process or whether it may be necessary to file a grievance or unilateral change charge at the board. Excellent. So one of the uh, one of the questions that came up was reference to my my comment earlier about one phone or two phones. Uh, we see a lot of employees uh, that have two phones to keep their quote personalized life separate from their business life, so that they have their conveniences of a phone with them at all time. But that the employer can't monitor uh, their personal phone because they can't reach into that personal device. Uh, I always ask those individuals that have that set up whether or not they ever work from their personal phone. And I'd say about 99% of the time, everybody's broken that barrier. Uh, it could be phone calls. It could be text messages with colleagues. And so that it, it is this false sense of security. Now, it, it does distinguish what the employer generally can monitor, but not necessarily uh, what could become uh, part of an investigation. Uh, so there's another question real quick, maybe off topic, but what about an employer seeking access to a former employee's email, specifically a union employee? So they're a former employee, they're no longer part of the company. What if now I would need to go in and investigate something post-discharge? Sure, that's that's a really interesting question, and I could see that come up in a variety of contexts. Take Take a harassment investigation as but one example. You've got an employee who, who has left employment and thereafter some allegations arise that that employee who just left might have treated another employee inappropriately. I don't think that there would be a significant issue from either a National Labor Relations Act or Title VII perspective in looking through that former employee's email because at the end of the day, it does remain the employer's data. Now, I think that you could get into some hypotheticals where to the extent the employee has not has, has been out for fewer than six months and the National Labor Relations Boards um, might still assert jurisdiction, you know, you could come up with some hypotheticals that, that you might be able to raise a ULP charge on eventually, but I don't think that's uh, circumstances present here. Excellent. We have just a few minutes left. I do want to make sure we get to that checklist. Uh, for the audience, we wanted to give you a few questions that you could be asking either yourself or your internal teams, your outside counsel. Are you ready? Do you know what data you have? Do you understand how you're monitoring it? Do you have a legitimate business purposes? All of these are good guidelines, regardless if you have a union, regardless if you have a problem, because these are good data guidelines uh, in general, uh, good employee relation guidelines. But uh, with two minutes to spare. Willie, any parting thoughts for the audience? Uh, no, they're just that uh, I think as we've been discussing that all of this is still developing. And so uh, there may be changes even next week that, that would uh, implicate many of the points we made today. And so we all need to be doing our best to understand this technology as best as we can and communicate with each other so that everyone's rights are protected. I think all this is this conversation is about balancing the rights between employers and unions and their members and our workers. And so uh, I think that's the note to leave on. Gary, you got less than 60 seconds, sir. I will do my best. I, I think that Willie is absolutely right. And the only gloss, gloss that I would add to that is to the extent you as an employer are bringing on new technology, it is critical from step zero to understand what it does. And as we've talked about, understand where that data lives and who has access to that data and ask yourself whether or not they, that person who has access actually has a reason to and a need for that data. Because if you don't have the business case locked up, I think Willie's absolutely right. The speed of technology now is moving so fast that you know you're just going to get left behind absolutely and with that laney i think you've got about 20 seconds to close us out thank you everybody for joining us today we hope you found it helpful there's also a resource tab uh, at the end of the presentation with a uh, slew of links that you can reference for additional information yes yes hunter that's perfect actually um i want to thank you and our 
um, other speakers, Willie and Carrie. Thank you so much, and thank you to our audience. Uh, we hope that you found this webinar informative and useful, given all the questions that came in. Um, uh, I'd like to encourage folks to continue to use this time to write any last questions. Speakers will get back to you after the presentation. Um, and if your questions were not answered, uh, know that someone will follow up with you. Um, also, if you haven't done so already, just as Hunter said, please be sure to download the resources. The complete slide presentation is there. There's also a separate PDF that has the links that Hunter um, talked about, so you can have easy access to that. Um, if you haven't done so, complete the survey. And um, as finally, as a reminder, you will receive a link to this presentation for on-demand viewing and to share it with members of your team who you think might find this presentation and conversation of interest. So thank you again to everyone. Thanks for joining us today, and we look forward to hosting you at our next event. Have a great day, all.